now comes another source of inspiration, our honoree and uh, keynote speaker. The Columbia Journalism Award is the school's highest honor. It is voted on by the faculty for singular journalistic performance in the public interest. It's presented annually to someone of great accomplishment and distinguished service to journalism, and it's been presented each year since 1958 uh, some of the past winners include David Halberstam, Ben Bradley, Pete Hamill, Joan Didion, Walter Cronkite, Alan Rusbridger, Nina Totenberg, Lise Doucette, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and last year, Ira Glass. This year, the, the award is being presented to Maria Ressa. Maria is an investigative journalist, executive editor, CEO of the online publication Rappler in the Philippines. She was recognized by the journalism school's faculty for the depth and quality of her work, as well as her courage and persistence in the field. She's needed this courage because the Duterte regime in the Philippines has filed something like a dozen cases against her organization. And she continues to publish and to push into all of the places uh, where journalism is desperately needed to illuminate both the causes of violence and, and the sources of disinformation, uh, not just there but across Asia. She's worked as a journalist in Asia for, for more than 30 years. She co-founded Rappler in 2012. She helped to turn it into one of the most influential and innovative news organizations in the Philippines while under this kind of pressure. Earlier, she was CNN's bureau chief in Manila, then in Jakarta. Later, she became CNN's lead investigative reporter focusing on terrorism in Southeast Asia. And she's authored two books, Seeds of Terror, an eyewitness account of Al-Qaeda's newest center of operations in Southeast Asia, and a second book called From Bin Laden to Facebook. Maria Ressa has been honored around the world for her courage and for her work in fighting disinformation and, and for her uh, unwillingness to be silenced under pressure. In 2018 alone, she won the Golden Pen of Freedom Award from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers, the Knight International Journalism Award of the International Center for Journalists, and the Gwen Ifill Press Freedom Award of the Committee to Protect Journalists, among others. It's my great pleasure to welcome Maria Ressa to the school, this year's recipient of the Columbia Journalism Award. This is yours. I'll take it to your seat so you don't have to hold it. Thank you. Thank you that. I'll take this. Gosh, I'm short. <laughs> Thank you. Let me pull this down. Um, thank you, Dean. So nice to see so many friends, uh, faculty, the parents, and I'm going to tiptoe so you can see me a little bit above. And class of 2019, congratulations! <laughs> you, it's so wonderful to hear Maura's speech before me. Uh, you are graduating at this crucial moment in history when journalists all around the world are under attack because we hold the line, because we live our mission, because, as Time Magazine wrote, we are the guardians of truth. There are consequences to your choice to be here, and it sounds like you know what they are. You are joining the front lines. So let's be clear about that. Um, I know this firsthand um, on February 13th. <laughs> now I can see you. Wow, awesome. All right. Um, I was just going to tell you, you know, when you're short, you need to, <laughs> you need to lift up. Anyway, um, I love the energy you guys have. Um, so I was just going to tell you what I know firsthand, which I wish I never learned. Um, and this is this year on February 13th a day before Valentine's Day, I'll always remember this, plainclothes agents from our, our FBI in the Philippines, the National Bureau of Investigation, they came to our office to arrest me. Our young reporters at Rappler, as we have drilled, took out their phones, I hope you always have this, and went live. So my arrest was live. Um, one of the officers came up to one of our reporters and tried to intimidate her. That'll happen to you. You can hear what he said on the live stream. He said, be silent or you're next. In that five week period, I was arrested twice. Uh, I was detained once, 
de deliberately kept overnight so that I guess the government wanted me to feel its power. They wanted to intimidate and to harass. Um, and then on Valentine's Day, my government's gift is that they allowed me to post bail. In 14 months, the Philippine government filed 11 investigations and cases against us. I've had to post bail eight times in three months. To be free and to be here today, thank you for inviting me. I have paid, along with our directors, nearly 3 million pesos. That's about 60,000 US dollars. That's hefty when you compare that to Imelda Marcos, who was actually convicted. My arraignments have just begun. Her bail is about $9,000, right? That's less than the $10,000 travel bond from just one court that I was given one day before I was supposed to get on the flight to come here. But I'm here. That's the cool thing. <laughs> the battle for truth. This is at the heart of protecting our democracies. We know, have always known, that information is power and these times, as you join us at the front lines, these times prove that. Propaganda has always been around, everyone will tell you that, but we've never felt it like today because technology has enabled mass manipulation at a scale I could never have imagined. At its heart is this creative destruction of our information ecosystem. Exponential attacks online are a new weapon unleashed against journalists and activists around the world. It is personal, it is psychological, it is meant to pound you to silence. In 2016, after a series exposing the Philippine government's propaganda machine, we called it Propaganda War, I was pounded by the hour by an average of 90, 90 hate messages. That's per hour, right? This is asymmetrical warfare, information operations, and it comes directly to your cell phone. No news organization, no one can protect you from that. Since two-thirds of your graduating class are women, go, Columbia, since two-thirds are women, So since two-thirds of you are women, I have to tell you that the numbers, the studies show us that women are attacked anywhere from three to ten times more than men. And the attacks are vicious. It is about how you look, how you sound, how you walk, how you talk, and these attacks quickly turn sexual. Researcher Camille Francois coined a term for it, patriotic trolling, online state-sponsored hate, targeting those who question power and are perceived. You don't even have to be critics. You are just perceived to be critics. The sentence for our times, a lie told a million times is truth. Without the facts, there is no truth. Without the truth, there is no trust. We have data from the Philippines showing how journalists and news groups have been insidiously and systematically attacked on social media. This is happening not just in the Philippines, it's happening here in the United States and many other countries around the world. It tears down credibility and splinters our communities. These bottom-up attacks, like AstroTurf, co-opt they jump to co-opted newspapers infiltrating traditional media. In the Philippines, it's the Manila Times, which the owner, the chairman emeritus, is the head of international public relations for President Duterte. Then, it's top down from the government. In situations like this, the voice with the loudest megaphone wins. Duterte, Trump, Putin. At the heart of all of this, this destruction are American social media technology platforms. They've taken away the gatekeeping powers of journalists, but they've neglected the responsibilities. 
They are now the world's largest distributor of news, allowing lies to spread faster than facts. Laced with anger and hate, these fueled the worst of human nature, imploding democracies around the world. This is death by a thousand cuts. Like an accelerant in a fire, they help elect populist and authoritarian style leaders. In the case of the Philippines, it helps maintain the popularity of our president. He's very popular. It's trumpeted exponentially on Facebook, astroturfing and creating a bandwagon effect that actually had an impact on our midterm elections. Just last night, our new senators were elected. And for the first time since 1938, that's 81 years, since 1938, not one opposition senator is joining the Philippine Senate. By now, your parents are saying, what are my kids getting into? <laughs> your kids. The future journalists, the journalists joining us today. You will have the greatest job in the world. And you will have the power to create a new and better world. You probably won't become billionaires like Morehouse. I can't pay for your student tuition here. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> but I promise, because of the time you're graduating, you will be leaders. Leadership requires courage. And I, I hear that you heard about courage yesterday from Margaret. But there are many different kinds our industry and our world today needs. Now more than ever, we need leaders who have courage. I heard from Wyra, you already know journalism is a calling. It tests you physically, mentally, and spiritually. The first type of courage, I think, is the easiest one. And I'm going to go back in time to what brought me to journalism. You know, as, as a war zone correspondent, courage was about going in when others were leaving and staying with the story because being there makes a difference. It's about being responsible for the actions and the lives of the people who follow you, your team. And because you take that responsibility, making sure your choices go beyond your own selfish interests. Then there's the second, inner courage, self-control. Fighting your own anger and fears, now more important than ever because that's what's being attacked, right? When you're a leader, you can't afford to lose it. Whether in Indonesia, East Timor, Kashmir, or Pakistan, conflict reporting requires presence of mind and clarity of thought. You can't do that if you're lost in emotions or in a blame game where, when things go wrong. All of that is a waste of time and energy. And if you wallow in emotions, you'll make the wrong decision. Save it for later, solve the problem first. From something as basic as last-minute information coming in before a live shot, you absorb it, instantly organize it in your head, maintain clarity of thought for the big picture to deliver the information in the simplest way possible when the anchor tosses to you. That's the easy test. A harder one is staying present tense on coverage like the time a bomb exploded in Pakistan and my cameraman rushed towards it. I remembered the way the terrorists operated and pulled him back, asked him to come back. Sure enough, a few minutes later, a second larger bomb exploded, harming those who were drawn by the first one. Or one of the toughest moral choices I've had to make this time in East Timor. It was in the final days of the Indonesian military scorched earth policy when they were killing pro-independent supporters. My team and I were leaving the capital, Dili, to head to Suai, which is about four hours away. We were about halfway there when we stopped for gas and a source came running to our car. He asked for a ride back to Dili because he said he was being hunted. He feared for his life. I couldn't turn the car around because we needed to get to Suai after these reports of violence. 
I couldn't bring him with us because it would take him directly to the military and make my entire team vulnerable. Our first responsibility was to get the story, get the story for our global audience. So I told him we would pick him up that evening on our way back to Dili. He would just have to last a few hours. We came back, it was dark, we were an hour late. He wasn't there. And only later would I find out he had been killed. In situations of anarchy and war, Steve knows this, it's hard to distinguish right from wrong. There is only your mission, the purpose you were there. Then there is, and this part has kept me through the last three years, the courage of your convictions. Speaking against injustice, the abuse of power, taking a position based on principles, drawing lines you will never cross because on this side of the line you're good and on this side you're evil. This is where Rapplers, we always use hashtag hold the line, this is where it comes from, a lifetime of learning for me. The only way you will stick to the ideals you have now is if you define this now. Before you're tested, draw the line. Know your whys to figure out the what. That's why I liked hearing what Myra had to say. When I chose my home and returned to the Philippines at the end of 2004, I, I headed the largest news group in our country. This courage, the last one, the courage of convictions is what I needed because at that point, I wanted to change culture. I was heading a news group of about a thousand people. It was about standing up to vested interests of power from the owners to politicians to corporations and lobby groups. We took a zero tolerance approach to corruption, firing anyone found guilty of accepting or soliciting a bribe. That's rare in the Philippines where corruption is endemic. We tried to build a culture of transparency, of meritocracy, to eliminate feudal ways of management and give a level playing field. It didn't make me popular. <laughs> Which brings me to today. So, in many ways, my entire career has prepared me for today's battles, like going to the gym, right? The things you do from this moment on will flex the muscles you need 30 years from now. When people ask me where I find courage, I'm puzzled because I'm not doing anything differently from what I've always done. Yes, we have a lot more problems, a lot more attacks, and yes, being arrested is a new experience, um, something I wish I didn't have to go through, but journalism is not a crime, and now more than ever, our societies need journalists with purpose and with mission. All I do is put one foot in front of the other, hold up the sky so my team can continue its work. It's just my bad luck that the baton was passed to me at this moment in time, because this is the time when standards and ethics matter. This is the time that determines who you really are. There are two main problems you have to solve. I've already told you about one, uh, the battle for truth. But this is larger than just one organization, one country. This is how geopolitical power players are using technology to manipulate facts, create new realities for power, right? This is what they're after. I always joke that in the Philippines, after President Duterte announced in 2016 that the Philippines would pivot from the United States to China and Russia, um, Russia, well, now takes care of B to C. If you're looking at doing a startup, B to C, they're going directly to the consumer, using information warfare, first against its citizens, then in Ukraine, and now it is global. China is B to B, giving the Philippine government video surveillance equipment, for example. That was just announced a few months ago. The second battle you will be in is something all news groups know today. The media business model is dead. 
The lion's share of digital ad spend is going to the technology platforms, the same companies that have enabled the attacks against truth, the attacks that will happen and come your way. So where do we find hope? Hope. I find hope from Rapplers and the award that you have given me, that belongs to Rappler. It's the way our sales and research teams defined a new business model that has pushed us quarter on quarter, 200% up this year versus last year, using techniques our investigative journalists used to find disinformation networks. The way we use, they learned to use data to fight back, the way our young reporters stand up to power and just continue reporting. They are creating the future today. They inspire me. I find hope from the grandfather at the airport who stopped me and brought his grandson. And with tears in his eyes, he asked me, what's going to happen to our country? I don't know, but I couldn't tell him that, right? Or the family right after him who hugged me like I was their long lost daughter. Uh, journalists are moving into strange places and the lines are blurred. <sighs> More than anything, listening to you in the short time I've been in, on stage, I find hope from you sitting in this hall the great Columbia class of 2019. A third of you overseas, two thirds women. I heard, Moira, the idealism that you have. I want to see you infuse that idealism into our industry, into our mission. Live according to the values you've learned here. Please don't accept the world as you see it today. Our information ecosystem is broken. A virus has been unleashed in this global body politic and it is slowly killing us. I wish you the courage to lead the way in finding a global solution, a vaccine that can combine journalism and technology. You are coming of age at a time that matters. What you do matters. What you report and how you fight for truth matters. Our future now depends on you. So, congratulations, class of 2019. Sleep well tonight. <laughs> Dream of a better future. Then go and make it happen. Go.